Basically, I'm going to talk to you about the kind of controversial idea that um, teaching these inspirational children that you've seen this day is, is actually impossible to teach them ICT uh, in its current form. And what I'm going to do as uh, I click through is just show you that actually when IT started, it was quite narrow. You know, when we were dealing with these kind of valves and things that we saw earlier, that actually IT had a narrow field. It was, it was revolutionary, it was exciting, but it, it was narrow. Even when the microchip came around, it, it reduced sizes of things and, and, and it enabled things to spread, but it was still relatively narrow. In the recent years, especially the last five, with cloud computing and the Internet of Things and everything connected, it's rapidly, rapidly increased. And I'm going to talk to you possibly about why. Now, the skills have remained relatively the same at the core, um, we have logic coding, we have the electronics and, and the software design. But as the years progressed, you know, design, social media, and in, in more modern areas, the kind of idea of tracking all the data that we produce uh, and making sense of it is becoming vast and it's escalating quickly. And the reasoning before, for that is people didn't even think there'd be a personal computer in every household. And we have this kind of one-to-one -one martini tech, and for those younger among you, it was an old advert from Martini. It was called Any Place, Any Time, Anywhere. And actually, Any Place and Anywhere is slightly redundant when you think about it. It's the same thing, but it's a lovely slogan. And it just means that you can carry all the technology around with you. And our students often come in with three or four devices that connect to the internet, not just one-to-one -one anymore. It's many-to-one. And that's enabled things to talk to one another. All these devices that do these clever things, the fact that the wearable technology is growing, the fact the watch can now actually control the lights in my house and the heating, uh, and we think nothing of it. And in the future, that will be augmentation. The idea that we're, we're only touching on now that was kind of briefly mentioned is the moral aspect. Do you take out your perfectly good eye and replace it with a digital one that can see further in the dark, infrared, uh, and all these ideas that actually in the future are going to be moral questions that people have to ask themselves? Thankfully, it's not here. That's the young people's decision. Now, this all came about because George Moore uh, identified in the, in the 60s that the density of transistors was, uh, seemed to be doubling every year. It was an observation he made. And he predicted that the speed of technology and the size of technology would double every year. It was slightly adjusted to every two years. But it's an observation and prediction that has come true. And it's held its 50th anniversary, that prediction, this year. In fact, to help my presentation, um, Bill Gates tweeted for me, and it's a personal connection. But he, he did actually say that it was an a, a unbelievable prediction to have noticed that and that it's still going strong today because people thought that there would be a limit, uh, a limit to this prediction, which, which hasn't actually happened. And the idea is exponential growth. And the mathematician in me will show you a graph and will say to you that it's just doubling, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and you go through and you'll notice that it's, it's so inherent to all technology, and it's also your iPhone model series, if you think about the sizes as you go up, and that's no accident. And what Apple actually found, if you look at their CPU performance when they brought out the 5S, is that exponential growth is still occurring. It's not changed, and, and this is 50-year-old prediction. I've grown up through that kind of technology uh, increase and the fact that your calculator now has more processing power than my first computer. And, you know, it's, it's scary to see that, but actually knowing exponential growth, it should be scarier to you to know what's coming up in the future. Because when you look at exponential growth, you see it and you kind of understand it. But when I zoom out, and that's after 20 series, and I then go to 41, the numbers get huge on the side, but you don't really get a flavor of how big exponential growth is. So usually when I'm teaching it, I ask quite a simple question. And I say, if you take a piece of paper and you fold it, how many times can you fold that piece of paper till it reaches from here to the thickness of the moon? And then you'll always get the clever student saying, it's only seven times, you can only do it seven. Actually, the record's 12. I've looked it up. And um, basically, we take that idea away. Just imagine you could fold it. How many times would you fold it? And think of a number in your head right now and just think, you're probably thinking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. It's 43. 43 folds of a piece of paper, and that paper would be the thickness of uh, from here to the moon. And there's disbelievers out there, but I'm a mathematician, so I've done it. And a piece of paper is a roughly that thickness. I've converted it to kilometers for you because we're going to get big. And the average distance, because it's an elliptical orbit, is 384,000 kilometers. Wikipedia told me so. And 
when you go through and you start doubling, it's very, very small numbers. And you increase up, and even at 25, I'm only at 1.6 kilometers at 25 folds, yet I've told you it's 43. But what's quite clever about exponential growth is it's those last few steps that get you there. Those last few, from 36 uh, folds to 43, we've suddenly got there in that last fold. Well, it makes sense, because the last fold was halfway, and the one before that was a quarter. So when you work backwards, it kind of makes sense. But we don't gather how fast that these numbers in increase. And then the question I ask is, well, where would 103 folds take you? Because you've got an idea now, 43 takes you from here to the moon. Where would 103 take you? And I'm a visual learner, so I've got my visual. So there's the moon, there's 43 folds, and then we approach Mars, and you think, yeah, that's it, Mars. But it's not. We go through the asteroid belt, we actually go past Jupiter, we're still nowhere near the 103 folds. In fact, we have to actually disappear out of our entire solar system, because it's not even the size of the solar system, until we found our minuscule point in the galaxy. Our galaxy, and you think, there we go, 103 folds, it's the galaxy. It isn't. Okay, we have to actually come out of our own Milky Way, past Andromeda, which is the nearest major, uh, major uh, galaxy. And we come out and we actually find that 103 folds isn't the size of a galaxy, even to the next one. It's actually the thickness of the observable universe at 103 folds, where 43 was just there to the moon. And suddenly I've digressed. So what? I talked to you about teaching ICT, and suddenly it's pieces of paper and the universe. Well, the idea is there that I told you that technology was doubling in speed, and that is escalating quickly. And we're really at a time now where schools need to get on board with this rate of change uh, and not react to it, because that will be too slow. And schools ICT roughly was dominated by one product up until even last year, and that was pretty much it. Excel, PowerPoint, you knew it, that's what you did. And you know, it's not a hugely bad thing. We work in offices, it's a useful skill. But technology is becoming more than that. And thankfully, there's a new computing curriculum that's, that's in force this year, and it does address elements of that. Uh, computer science is now, is now taking over considerably, but we're missing out so much more still. These elements aren't taught in that. We may briefly mention them, but they're not taught. And, and they're, they're essential whenever I talk to industry about it. So when we look at the past, present, and future of these kind of skills, we say that you know, word processing, databases, all these things are being taught, and now with a new curriculum, we are expanding that, and there's a new emphasis on computer science, which is great. But the future shouldn't be the future. The future is now. We should actually be teaching design, and actually 3D design, more importantly. Computer science should include way more. Uh, we talk about all these things, and it's been mentioned today, artificial intelligence, robotic, electronics. This needs to be taught in schools. But my problem is that number. That, that number is the amount of hours I get to teach the students before GCSE when they come into uh, secondary school. That's how much time I've got to teach all that stuff. It's impossible. And that's not even counting them coming in, getting settled, telling them what. It's actually more like 60-something hours. And that's how much time I have to spend on the GCSE exams. But that's non-negotiable. I've got a curriculum that I have to teach. I've got exams to do. That time is gone as far as we're concerned. And it's still stuck in the past, if we're being blatantly honest. So what's the solution? Well, my solution is actually that we need to do these individual learning plus. And I, I'm quite evangelical over the last few years about a method called flip learning, which I'm going to explain. And to get you there, it's, I'm going to tell you about my journey. And my journey started in a library that old place that still exists. But Jersey Library, I used to go to every Friday, and I'd get out one of my favorite books, because I loved basic. I loved my ZX Spectrum. And I'd spend Friday night having a look through the book to choose which game I'd like. I still, for those coders in the room, have joy when I see this. I remember doing it for the first time. I do, yeah. And it was, it was amazing. I made it. When, as soon as that Hello World went on, and I had to work out where Escape and Break was, um, Basically, there was joy there. So I'd spend Saturday painstakingly copying word for word, character for character, that program onto my computer. And then I would go into Sunday morning, and yes, homage to my old Commodore 64 too as well, and I'd spend the morning working out where all the errors were, the typos that I'd made, copying word for word. There was no copy and paste. Okay, something you'll never experience, and I, I, never, I never want you to. And then I'd go out to play. I still played, you know? People do, kids do. There was this negativity with IT. I fit, I fit things in. But there was a horror, a horror when I came home after playing on a Sunday morning, 
the horror of the sound of the hoover. And the reason why I had horror with this is if my mum was hoovering in my room, she had taken out the plug of my computer, and all my work had gone, and there was no save button. Save buttons did not exist. Another horror story you'll never experience. And if I was lucky enough and my mum hadn't pulled out that plug, I got to play that amazing game. Okay, and it was amazing. It still is amazing. Okay, and I loved it. You know, that, that's how I did. But did I learn anything? I learned bits and bobs. I picked up things here and there. But there was no one to guide me. It wasn't taught at schools. Um, and I, I kind of just got what the idea was. There was, there was nothing to teach me, no one to, to guide me through that. Uh, but you have a lovely tool in this generation. I learned to actually uh, do the flooring in my house using YouTube. I gave it a go. Nothing, nothing's broke yet. Um, it works. And, and YouTube's brilliant because people can actually show you what to do. They can give you that understanding to help you guide your way through it. And that's what flipped learning is. It's taking that learning and, it, and it's taking it home outside the classroom and it's giving you the tools to, to go off and explore yourself because we don't have the time. And this is an example of a series of lessons that I don't even teach in the classroom. Uh, any of the students can go online to this class and, and teach it. And it's freely available to any school that wants it. They just have to ask. In fact, um, I'll, I'll be starting a, a website that all schools can, can grab any of my materials off uh, in September. And they do it. You know, I know they do it because they come to me at break time and say, I was stuck on that video. Can you help me? Yeah, I'll get you through it. But they do this on their own, completely on their own, because it's nothing to do with what, I, what I'm doing and what I've been told to do in the curriculum. And... When we do that kind of thing, this is what it looks like. And this is full volume, by the way. You can hear the typing of the keys. Okay? And the danger is that it feels very sterile. It kind of is sterile. But in their ears, in those earphones, is me talking to them at the rate at which they learn. Not the rate at which schools are bound to at the slowest learner. Schools have to teach at the rate of the slowest learner. You can't leave someone behind in the classroom. Um, but there are methods to deal with that. And here, we've got students uh, carrying on forward and doing it. Hopefully, we haven't got too many of these, okay? Bored students. Not bored students because they don't like ICT. Bored students because they're being held back. Uh, and that's the real pain that, that exists. We need these students to fly. I, I've got one particularly irritating yet wonderful student who I will do a series of three or four lessons for in, in the way that you've just seen here. And she's a touch typist, and she'll get through it in one lesson. And I've then got to create another four beautiful lessons for this wonderful child. But that's brilliant. But the, the really sad truth of it was, as a teacher, is I have to admit that I was holding that child back over the years. And they were a nice kid, that's why they didn't say anything. And, and we have to give them these opportunities, these pathways uh, for learning. Now, I watched Star Trek as I was doing this, and what I'm not advocating is this world of Vulcan drones, the motionless robots in their own little learning pods. Um, going away and learning what they need to learn. But weirdly, that's kind of the ultimate goal of individual learning, where every child is given the content that they require to move forward. But then YouTube offers us these kind of wonderful experiments. Uh, an Australian teacher that, in just a moment, does the sodium experiment in a completely health and safety free world, apparently, that Australia lives in. Um, and those students are absolutely enjoying it, but it must just be the UK because America has also joined this wonderful world of no health and safety. Wonderful video. If any of the science kids came home and told their parents that had happened, I can't imagine. I can't imagine what's just happened. But it's not just the teachers creating these videos. The students can create their own experiments to do with electricity, and it ends as expected. John, in the end, is taking his shoes off. He now has no insulator. <laughs> <laughs> and they will definitely learn what an insulator means now. And, and that's the wonderful nature of it. We can give them access to all this, all this material that exists. And that's really the goal of it. Um, I look at the computing curriculum, I look at ICT, and what I can do as a kind of jack of all trades, master of none, because if I was a master of everything, I certainly wouldn't be riding here on a moped today. I'd be on my yacht. But what would happen is I can teach them the bits. I can teach them the productivity. Media is still, still a very important part. I can teach them uh, the kind of theory, the hardware, the security. I can give them these starting points with the coding. But what we're then looking at is I want them to go further. 
I want them to find out all those niche areas of ICT, because we need IC niche areas. We can't be producing drones that are kind of just generally OK at ICT. We need specialists. But the problem is, how do I get that child there and that child there? How do I find what excites that one person? Because coding doesn't excite everybody, but media excites others, coding excites some. Weirdly, security does excite other people, but uh, <laughs> I know there's one in the room. But um, basically, it's, it's my job to do that, but I need help from not just teachers, I need experts, I need industry to help me find these individual learning pathways. Now, I know this is the right method, because my wife thankfully helped me out for my presentation by uh, videoing my daughter, or Princess Elsa, as she wanted to be known that particular day. And she has an iPod that uh, we downloaded some apps that school told us to get and some that I have. And we didn't know on this video, that, on this particular app, that there was a video on how she could draw. And she found this video and she presses pause when it goes too fast. She then draws again what's happening. She rewinds and she does it. I've not taught her that. I'm actually, I, I actually shield my daughter quite a lot from technology. I'm gonna, I'm, I don't try and push it. I give her enough. But, you know, she loves to draw, so I let her draw. And she found this and she did it. So the kids have this inherent knowledge and, and use of, they've brought up with YouTube and, and that kind of video technology. So we come back to the original question, is teaching in the 21st century impossible? Well, currently it is, but it's not impossible if you change the way in which it's taught. And we can do that using methods like this, but there was still a huge chunk of time that we were wasting, and it's to do with that. Exams, I, I, they have their place, but I don't think it's in a school. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but I'm sure they have a place. Um, because we spend so much time, 95 hours lost to teaching to a specification that I think is old. Um, but we have this inherent kind of want to compare people, you know? And we want to compare the very best schools with the most privileged backgrounds with the students going there to those with more challenging backgrounds, and that's not right. We've got to move away from this comparison of schools and just trust schools again to teach your children and show them the way forward. So. I've noticed it in the tech industry. People have been moving away from asking from exam results, and they want to see portfolios. They want to see the work, that, the inspirational work that we've seen the children today do, that Tom does. And that's what excites people. That's what gets them going. So you have to join me. And, and Ken Robinson is talking about a teaching revolution this year. And the revolution, it, it starts with industry. It starts with parents about moving away from this fascination with grades and levels and actually just starting to look at what your child is interested in and going 100% and backing them down that road. And we'll give them the tools to go there. And we will give them these portfolios, and they will come and they will say, I want this job, but here's what I can do. And it will wow you. It will take you a minute to have a look at what, you, or what they do, and, and you will be impressed. So there is a revolution. It's going to be hard fought, and sometimes I think it's just pie-in-the-sky thinking. But you've heard it from many of the people here today. And you go online and you hear people like, like Ken Robinson talking about that. And there's a want for it. And we need to pit find the people higher up the chain that make those decisions to stop comparing and actually just start making individual learning a thing of the future again. So thank you for listening. Okay.